New York City, you listen to me. If you're near a convenience store right now, any type of 24-hour store, go into the store right now and put your hand in the cash register for no reason. Their money is your money, as of right now. The Sock Jake Sneaker Podcast. Designed the Sean Weatherspoon Air Max 97. Welcome to episode 57 of the Sock Jig Sneaker Podcast. I'm your host, Sock Jig. You can follow me on Twitter at Sock Jig and on Instagram as well. I'm back with a regular show to talk about some recent topics, some summer topics that I haven't covered in a while, having a couple themed episodes and interviews. You know, it's nice to go slow in the summer, the dog days of summer. You can't have quiet without loud. You can't have fast without slow. But it's basically the fall soon, so back in action, and I'll be dropping more episodes on a more consistent basis. And I'll be back to dropping socks again. Same kind of thing, I just wanted to take it easy this last few months. Some of the topics for this episode, I talk about Cool Key and Nike, and I kind of give my full context of that story. I also give some more context about a couple posts I had on Twitter about this Nightwing guy and his post about taking flowers. I share some thoughts about Tremaine leaving Supreme, and I had recorded a couple other topics for the podcast as well, but just cut them. Like, I had a whole segment on the Meek Mill thing, and that video is like three weeks ago and feels like ancient history. I recommend you listen to Loose Laces podcast for that one. And previous guest Davon Goddard Frames had talked about his personal experience selling glasses to celebrities and those who paid and those who were cheap about it. I also had a segment called Crenshaw Skate Club industry plant question mark that I also cut. So so as I've said in the past, I don't feel like I need to talk about every single topic in sneakers. There's just too many. But the main topic for this episode is about fake sneakers, stolen sneakers, and backdoor sneakers. And talking about how Nike sneakers are being stolen at every level of the supply chain and how that's affecting the stock price of big retailers. And I take a look at the early pairs that we see and where do they come from? Are they stolen? Are they fake? Or are they backdoored? I also have a new segment called Size 13 Takes. But before that, I'll talk about on feet, pickups, and skips and misses. On feet for most of the summer has been the Baklava New Balance 990 V6. That's the Action Bronson pair. And I love that pair. It's so easy to put on. It's super comfortable. I've been wearing it basically every day. But I did go on a trip to San Francisco a couple weeks ago and I was working for a few days and I was off for a few days, but I only packed a single pair and I picked the HAL Studios, the OG pair of the A61130. That was the shoe that I could come up with that fit my work fits and would also be comfortable when I'd be walking around when I'm on vacation part. Usually I take like two or three pairs of sneakers with me, but this time I was like, I'm only going to take one. And When I was there, when I was at work, I got two compliments from people. So, you know, anytime you get a compliment on your sneakers, it's always fun. And that's a sneaker that, you know, you have to be a sneakerhead to know what you're wearing. Otherwise, it just looks like a plain pair of Asics. But super comfortable the whole time. Pickups, my pickups list might be pretty long because this is a list from like a couple months ago since I haven't done this segment. I got the X-Men Asics Kith Ronnie Gel Light 3. I got the Cyclops pair. I was really happy with that. And I think I mentioned this on Twitter as well. I really did a 180 on this release and on the sneakers themselves. The photos, like when you're looking at a picture on a phone, even if you zoom in, sometimes the photo on your phone doesn't really do it justice. Pictures on a desktop often look better, but really you do have to see them in hand. And, you know, my criticism initially from those small photos that I saw was these just look like GR pairs. And in hand, the Cyclops pair that I have definitely does not look like a GR pair. It looks really premium. Overall, it was just a super fun drop. It was really well designed. You didn't know what you were going to get. I know people who got multiples got the same pair, and I think that's probably just how stuff is distributed when it's packed into boxes, and six in the same size are packed in the same box, and then at that warehouse, when they remove them, they just stack them all together, so I'm guessing that's what happened. I also picked up the Dime 2160 A6 as well. Happy to have those, and I think it'll end up being one of my favorites of the year when I start to wear it. I also got the Supersonic Vomero 5, the -the glow-in-the-dark one, and I haven't had a chance to wear those yet, but anytime I hear the word Supersonic, I think of the JJ Fad song. Maybe that's just me. But those two I haven't worn yet. 
I also got the Jordan 1 Black Toe from the Sneakers app. And I was in that thing where Sneakers app was pending for an hour. And I was like, what the fuck? I thought people said there's hundreds and thousands of these. But that's just sneakers being sneakers. And eventually it went through. I also got the Travis Utopia Air Force Ones. I know people are not big fans of this now, especially since it hasn't been shipping for a lot of people. But mine shipped right away. And what's hilarious is you can see which sizes have shipped by the price of it on StockX. The price for the size 12 is like 140 meanwhile size 13 or size nine and a half is probably like 300 or so so those are the pairs that haven't fully shipped yet as for the shoe you know obviously they could have done something more they could have made it its own skew but it's not it's just probably laser printed or screen printed or whatever but people want travis to make shoes for everyone and when he does people are like this is too many what are you doing how dare you touch a classic also got the Hal Studios A6 1130, the white pair, or as I call it, Yeti with a thirst for blood pair, when you put the red laces in. And this dropped when I was in San Francisco, so I was not looking forward to a 3.30 a.m. drop. I was just going to skip it. But luckily, I got a pre-order email the night before that if you had pre-ordered the previous pair, the Forest colorway, then he was automatically offering you this one as well, so... Done and done. I like it when he thoughtfully released a pair like this and I was able to get it. So I have the trilogy, but I don't have this pair in hand yet because it takes forever for stuff to come from Australia. I also picked up the Jordan 1 Union Summer of 96. And it's a super high quality sneaker in hand, just like the first Union one. And a shoe like this, I get like why people like it and why they don't like it. Uh, to me, it's got personality. It stands out. And there's a line where... Something stands out because it's different or it stands out because it's horrible because you crossed that line. So everyone's got a different marker of where that inflection point is. But in my mind, when things are like this, when things are different and weird, it helps both sides. It helps the OG classic stand out and it helps the people who like weird stuff stand out. So win-win. I just bright-sided that shoe again. I also picked up the Juan Wilson sample, the 01 pre-order that he did. If you know Juan Wilson from Twitter... He is of the community and for the community and I think represents himself really well and represents sneaker culture really well. So I'm happy to have those. I'm happy to finally get them on. I've been talking to him about the process of them for a while. So it's really cool when good people make good things and you just can't wait to support them. Also picked up two Solomons. I picked up the Notre pair and Essence pair, which I did a world premiere on on my Twitter, I guess. That was an Essence exclusive colorway. It looks like a Seahawks color midsole with a red brown upper. And I don't know when those are releasing. Those are offered to Essence VIPs. So I'm assuming other people have them, but just haven't posted them. And finally, I was able to get the Supreme Dunk Remo Z. Who looked like Voltron before Voltron Remo Z? And so I really recommend people look up these artists that Supreme does collabs with. There's a video on Remo Z on YouTube that's like nine minutes long. And it's awesome. Like... It covers a lot of his story. It covers what New York was like back then, his relationship with Basquiat and stuff like that. So anytime Supreme does artist collabs, I really do encourage you to go look up into these artists. It really will enhance the product that you have. So, you know, you're going to know the ones like uh, Cause or Damien Hurst or whoever, but these other ones like Dash Snow and Jaw One and stuff, they really do feature a lot of good artists. And, and later I will talk about Tremaine leaving Supreme because of an artist collab. In terms of misses, the biggest miss, I think, is the Mac Attacks OG. I really wanted that pair. And because I missed that one, I skipped all the social status ones because it's like, ah, uh, if I don't have the OG, I don't think I want these. I also missed out on that Crenshaw Skate Club Dunk SB drop that he did, which I was waiting for at 11 a.m. my time, which I guess dropped an hour earlier. But I saw the notification on Twitter, and I was the one who clicked Apple Pay, even though they disabled Apple Pay. So... I got a spinner while everyone else was checking out. And apparently on that, Rob, they did do some two-factor verification with your cell phone or something. So it was nice that real people were able to buy those. Just not me. In terms of stuff I skipped out, everything else I basically I haven't mentioned in the last couple of months. Jordan 1s, I skipped out on UNC Toe, Palomino 1s, the Mac Attacks, and the Ama Manier Airships, I skipped out on those as well. I didn't try for the Kobe 8 Halo, a plain white Kobe 8 is just not for me. I was joking with my Filipino friends that it's a sneaker made for Filipino nurses and my buddy laughed because he was like, my wife is Filipino, she's a nurse, she loves Kobe. Shout out to all my Filipino brothers, Kuya Sakjig hopes you get a pair. 
Maybe I'm not a Kuya. Maybe I'm a Tio. Maybe I'm an uncle. So stuff that's coming up I'm excited about. I'm excited about these J Balvins to come out. These A Cold Wall Air Max Plus. Air Max Plus has been doing a lot of really good GR models this year, but I haven't been buying because I already got a couple Air Max Plus. But if they go on sale, I might reach back and grab them. Joe Fresh Goods has a 650 releasing really soon. And this is another example where it's like, I can't exactly see a super close up photo of the shoe. And it looks like there's especially suede and other thick materials on it. So I've just learned to withhold judgment until I've seen better photos or in hand. But what's exciting about this drop is the story. The story is what if Michael Jordan signed to New Balance instead of Nike, you know, without saying Nike. And what's awesome about this is that there's really only one person who could tell a story like this, and that's Joe Fresh Goods. That's it. And Joe is obviously a friend of the program. Check out his episode if you haven't heard. And speaking with him off the air after the recording, he gave me a hint about the 650 drop coming soon and what it was about. And honestly, I had no clue how he would be able to pull it off, but I was pretty confident that he would. And here it is with all the visuals, the storytelling that he has. And he pulled it off. It looks awesome. In terms of the drop, I'm not sure if it's going to be Chicago only. If it's online, it'll probably be a raffle only. I don't know, but it's designed to be super limited and it's designed to bring attention. And I think we're going to see a lot more of these kind of drops going forward, just as a pullback from this big stock era that we've been in. And in terms of what else is coming out this year, that's what I like about sneakers and what i hope from q4 going forward in sneakers is it's just these unknown drops something that you don't even know or think about we know the stuff that gets leaked from jordan brand or nikes and stuff but stuff from asics or or new balance and things like that we never know what's coming one day palace will come out and say hey we got solomon or we got crocs or whatever and so hoping there's a lot of that going forward in q4 and that the product is good this is a new segment I'm calling Size 13 Takes. These are sneaker takes that only someone who's size 13 would have. They're probably older, they're probably called Unk, they probably still have Nike Talk in their bio on Twitter. So these are those people's takes. I'm representing for size 13, even though personally I'm a size 12. So I might add some cheesy royalty-free music on the background to add some ambiance to this, so let's go. Yeezys, I told you that shit was a flash in the pan. Bro, I don't give a fuck if size 9 is sitting. Size 13 sold out instantly. Jordan Brand finally got something with this Jason Tatum sneaker. Easily the best basketball sneaker in 20 years. Nike basketball, on the other hand, really needs to return to its glory days. Basketball shoes were just so much better when they were all leather. It's a damn travesty what they've done to the uptempo. Maybe I should become a longshoreman. You know what's wrong with kids today? Went to the mall wearing Aqua 8s. No one in the Foot Locker complimented me. That's what's wrong with this generation. They don't know anything about the classics. All they know is whatever Travis Scott mumbles at them. That upcoming Drake shoe though, that knocked a glide? Finally a good shoe from a rapper. I gotta ask someone on Facebook on how to get that in a size 13. Fat Kid Deals? Now that's a great fucking Twitter account. I got my sneaker container that fits my highs from there, the ones with the drop down doors and shit. The other ones, don't bother, they don't fit size 13. Get it from Fat Kid Deals. Toro 6, best Jordan of the year. UNC 6, number 2. Penny 5s, criminally slept on. My wife is leaving me. She said she wants a divorce. There you have it. If you found yourself having any of these takes and you're not size 13, get a Brannock device and remeasure yourself. You might be a size 13. I have to talk about Cool Key versus Nike being in the news this week because I was a bit of a part of it. I tweeted out that there was a consent judgment and permanent injunction against Cool Key with a link to the full PDF on the court listener site. A couple hours later, Cool Key himself called it fake news that it's not happening. I didn't understand why he was saying that at first. Finally, we pieced it together that it was actually against his partner, David Weeks. It was a bit confusing because Nike had apparently sued them together and also separately. And so David Weeks himself was the one who was settling. And the doc was confusing because on that link that I sent out, 
there was both of them named at the top, but in the body of the judgment itself, it was only David Weeks. So that was my mistake. I made that mistake and I owed it. I apologize for that. The link was out there for everyone to read, but also this is the power of community. We figured it out on Twitter and media, sneaker media saw my tweet and posted it as well. Some gave a hat tip to me like Nice Kicks and Soul Retriever, and they were a key part in figuring out what was going on and why Cool Key was saying it's fake news when the judgment seemingly read pretty clear if you skimmed it. And that was the thing. It was confusing. Others, you know, the usual suspects, the ball sack sneakers who don't follow me also reported it and didn't credit me. I wonder why. And then I joked that I can't believe the sneaker media got it wrong when they copied this from me. But, you know, what I learned is I should obviously be more careful. I should also not call myself an independent reporter as I have on this podcast before. I don't know what's better, podcaster, commentator, media personality, sneaker entertainer. Maybe that's what I am. Sneaker media is so small. Sometimes people are both. They're journalists sometimes and sneaker entertainers the other times. But I'm just posting tweets and publishing podcasts only. So that's not exactly journalism. And I'm not exactly unbiased. I'm biased as hell. But I'm fair and most of my takes have aged like fine wine. So I'll be all right. But in terms of the judgment against David Weeks and Cool Key himself with his case going forward, this judgment was very telling. I talked to my lawyer buddy, VNDSK, who I've credited with a lot of legal stuff before. And he said... That judgment tells you exactly what the judge thinks. He was very harsh on David Weeks that he can't do anything with partners. He gives up his copyrights. He agrees that Nike owns the copyrights or the trade dress or whatever. If you read it, it just says, you know, he did that shit. Guilty as fuck. But Cool Key himself, he did not settle and he's getting new lawyers. One of his previous lawyers is Zachary Kurtz, who's also known on Instagram and Twitter as Sneaker Legal. It says they left for ethical and conflict of interest reasons, so... So they must have been your honor. I've seen some crazy shit. Please excuse me and also seal this so no one else can see it. And can he win? Like, does he have some sort of smoking gun evidence that will sway the judge to not be as harsh on him as he was in that judgment against David Weeks? Probably not. Like, what is he going to say? Maybe he can negotiate a better settlement. You know, in the Weeks settlement, like I said, it, it didn't say that he had to pay Nike, but that just has to stop doing it. When John Geiger settled with Nike, he just had to agree to make changes to the sole and even got Nike to put out a joint statement saying we respect John Geiger and designers like them. <laughs> well, I don't think Nike is going to make a statement with Cool Key saying we respect Cool Key, especially when they called him a serial copyist. But Cool Key will be all right. I, you know, I use this metaphor all the time that everything is pro wrestling and in pro wrestling, there's bad guys and good guys and to some, Cool Key is a heel. He's the bad guy. But to others, he's a babyface. The people support him no matter what. He's the good guy. I don't know him. I don't know if his persona online and how he acts is like a pro wrestler, just part of an act. But I've watched enough pro wrestling to know a character and who's trying to work over a crowd for boos and cheers. And he does that very well. In the attention economy, any attention is good attention if it makes people who ride with you want to ride harder. I should rephrase that. But well, whatever it is, he connects with people. He's over with his crowd. And when you're over with a crowd, you can draw money. That is 100% the point of pro wrestling. You win a reaction from a crowd. You want the crowd to either see you or boo you and pay to do so. In this case, in this modern 2023 version, Cool Key does that. You know, he does all kinds of other shenanigans with pre-orders pending for a year and then drops it at a pop-up and people still support. He, he goes on and he'll talk about everyone is against me, everyone is against a black entrepreneur. Either he really feels that way or he's working a crowd that wants to hear that. The point of eliciting a reaction from people is to draw money. That is 100% the point of pro wrestling and that's also the point of what it takes when you're brand is yourself. Instead of drawing a crowd, you want to draw people to the product you're pushing. So if Cool Key loses to Nike and he makes a new model or makes a new t-shirt that says banned in Portland, whatever it is, the people who support him will probably support those new products. Look at Warren Lotus. Nike came down pretty hard on him. He rolled over super quickly and he's doing just fine right now. So you may not like him. He might lose, but Cool Key will be all right. 
I guess I have to talk about the other drama I started this past week. And in case you missed it, I had a tweet out, which was a quote tweet of something that Sneaker Fetish had tweeted. And it was a quote from Nightwing, who runs the Wear Testers performance YouTube channel, had posted on his Instagram. And it was a caption saying how he did breakdowns of tech videos six years ago, but stopped when people didn't watch. And others are now doing it, and he feels he's not getting the credit for being the trendsetter. And if he's not getting his flowers, he should take his flowers. And I read it, and I just thought it was bizarre. Like, there was obviously a subtweet at someone, and I don't know who, and I, I don't watch performance YouTube sneaker videos. And then I looked at the replies, and all the replies were all like, you're not lying, you're the OG, you go girl, that kind of shit. And no one was saying it's bizarre, and no one had the guts to say it was bizarre but if you're fans of him you're not gonna you know take a shot at him if you're a fan so i saw this like the day later and tweeted it and i said nightwing is in a respected position to elevate newcomers and peers and is instead subtweeting them for not getting credit for a concept he dropped he wrote a shit post about taking flowers a day after hanging out with tinker hatfield you're doing all right man so I'll explain my tweets here, and I had some follow-up tweets where I kind of mashed some other thoughts together, and some context is lost, but I'll give the full kind of context here. But first, some disclaimers. Like I said, I don't watch his videos. I don't follow him on Instagram or any of that. Uh, You know, Nightwing is Dick Grayson to me, not some performance footwear guy. I don't give a fuck about performance footwear. You know, tearing an ACL is a top five fear of mine. I don't give a fuck about the traction of an Under Armour Curry shoe or the court feel of a puma. You know, if you're an outsider looking at me, you think, oh, he doesn't have an empire like I do. He didn't build anything like I do. He's just jealous of what I have. And nothing can be farther from the truth. I don't want to do this shit full time. This is just a creative outlet for me. Maybe it's a midlife crisis for me, but he's going to have more likes on an Instagram post about taking flowers than I have followers on Instagram. That's fine. It's always going to be that way. So you may like his content. That's great. Keep liking it. I'm not trying to change your mind on it. I'm just trying to give my opinion. If you want to know about the court feel of a Puma and that's the kind of content that interests you, go right ahead. But I don't give a shit about this Nightwing guy or wear testers or anything they have to say about sneakers because of a video they did about Fragment Travis Jordan 1s and how they had fake versions and the real version. And they said that the fake was identical to the real one. And it was basically an implicit endorsement of fakes to a huge audience, which I thought was a shitty thing to do. And you could say whatever you want in a video. You could say, oh, fakes are bad. But if you're saying they're the same, identical, I can't tell the difference. And you're trying to frame it as some sort of criticism on resale and consumer culture. It doesn't really matter. A huge chunk of that audience will just hear, wow, I should just get the fakes. I'm also not trying to start a war. I said my piece and I moved on. I don't want his army after me. I just feel like you can criticize someone fairly or fair-ish and it's not hating. But this is 2023 and everything is hating these days, especially when it comes to fandom. But as I was trying to say, this is not exactly about him. I had mashed in a bunch of other thoughts that I've had about content creation. So that's what I want to clear up in this part. But back to the post, I mentioned that he was hanging out with Tinker Hatfield and Basically, he was. Just days earlier, there was an event in Portland hosted by Aaron A.C. Cooper, a longtime Nike designer. There was like 40, 50 people there that were Matt Halfhill was there, Sneaker Preservation Society, uh, ISS guy, Jacques Cousteau, and a whole bunch of others. There's a post on Instagram by Aaron A.C. Cooper, and he talks about what the event was about. It was about bringing together sneaker enthusiasts and talking about why stories matter And it was like this whole uplifting kumbaya, be a sponge, be a butterfly, be a domino, create momentum, whatever. There's a long description about it. It was just some sort of a positive community building place that this guy was at. So that's the context here. This guy was hanging out with Tinker Hatfield, Nike designers, other invited sneaker luminaries. And the day after that, after this kumbaya festival, he posted about the slights against him. That's what he learned from all that. So let me go back into his Instagram post that he posted after he came back from this Kumbaya Portland building community event with Tinker Hatfield. 
He goes, I published the first performance videos back on YouTube in 2009. This was six years ago. It was called Know Your Tech. Okay, here's a key part. Unfortunately, viewers didn't really show up for these videos and I was forced to stop making them because of it. Fast forward to today and people like to act like others are genius for doing something I did long ago. It's interesting to look back and see everything I've done in this sneaker space and not really receiving any kudos that others have since been given for things I started. He finishes it off with, quote, the lesson here is just do you and ignore the noise. Yeah, that's exactly what he's doing here. But anyways, quote, the loudest voices often have the least to say, and if they don't give you your flowers, then take them, end quote. Coming back from a kumbaya trip with Tinker Hatfield, he's like, where's my flowers? I did this shit. The shit that I purposely stopped doing because people stopped watching. So that was the part where I said, well, this is bizarre. You were just hanging out at a kumbaya trip with Tinker Hatfield and you come back taking shots. That's the community building that you learned there. That doesn't make any sense. I don't know what they said there, but I'm assuming when they're talking about be a sponge, be a butterfly, be a, a domino or whatever it is, they didn't say go back and take shot at your imaginary ops. So I had some other tweets about this, but I'll kind of explain a little bit about how I got there. So if you've worked an office job with lots of teams, there's a thing called silo mentality where a team can kind of build a wall, build it higher and higher, and they kind of stockpile their info and seal it within there. And in business books and stuff, there's a lot about breaking down silos that you should be collaborating with other people and other teams. So going forward, I'll be talking about sneakers and content creation, but really I could be talking about your work or anything or any thing about silos. So as like a content creator, if you want to operate and build a silo, a bubble, you have the right, go ahead. You can claim ownership over a field like performance tech sneakers in the past, the present, the future, whatever. You can invite your fans in and they'll give you flowers and you can say, fuck everyone. I didn't get help from anyone. I built this alone. You're fine and good in that silo. However, when you do that, you also have to not care about what others are doing or saying in their silo, especially about shit you stop doing. Because if you have your walled garden, who gives a fuck about what's happening in that walled garden over there? So that's where my follow-up tweet came from. I went from one thread to another and kind of connected them together, but I was trying to say more than just that. And this does not just apply to this dude here. This applies to Complex, to anyone else who's been building things for a long time. I said, a lot of long time sneaker content creators do not give a shit about elevating or helping others. Almost none have protégés or a network that they've helped build and elevate, but then get bitter when others rise up. Pathetic. I don't know, that's just the word I said. Maybe it was harsh. I don't give a shit now. If I hung out with Tinker Hatfield at some exclusive event about community building, and my first response was to subtweet imaginary ops and talking about taking flowers, that's pathetic. That's what you learned there. Like I said, Complex, they haven't elevated anyone, even within their own corporation. In business, you'll often hear about the hit by a bus problem, that if one guy has all the information and he gets hit by a bus, what are we going to do? It's kind of a ghoulish thing, but you know, so maybe not hit by a bus. Maybe they move to a different company. Maybe Jonah Peretti of BuzzFeed fires them all. You have no replacements because they never elevated anyone else to that level. But that's not exactly a me problem, that's a their problem, and it's up to them to figure it out, but I don't think they even want to. So these people are all just operating in silos. They're building silos. They're not worried about cross-collaboration. They don't want to work with others. They don't want to help elevate others. Maybe they don't have the personality for it. Maybe they think they pulled themselves out of the mud. I built this. Maybe they're just an insecure person. But if you worked with others and helped elevate others, and they succeeded and you succeeded, would you notice any outside noise of people talking shit about you? No, it wouldn't make a sound. That kind of shit would not hold any quarter. I talked about everything is pro wrestling and there's a pro wrestler, his name is Terry Funk, who died recently. And by all accounts, Terry Funk was the nicest man. He helped so many others. One of the common patterns was he was always learning and doing new things. And that's because he was always embracing the next generation. He was not writing them off. He was not saying back in my day to them. He was learning from them and doing moonsaults at the age of 50. That's when he started doing a moonsault at the age of 50, not earlier in his career. He was always adapting and learning. He could see where things were going and he adapted and grew. Terry Funk had the vision. 
this Nightwing guy, if he was doing Know Your Tech or whatever it was six years ago and then dropped it because of metrics, he did not have the vision. You have to see where things are going and embrace the future and embrace what others are doing and then add it to your own repertoire. And if you do that, you also will not get stale. And that's what I was trying to say in a follow-up tweet. I was saying, for any content creator, new or old, here's a secret to never getting stale. Always have something going on and try new things. That's it. It's simple as that. If you can't do that, then the word is on the street that the fire in your heart is out to quote Oasis there. If you have a platform, a huge platform, a small platform, whatever it is, and if you help and elevate others, it will also help you. You will learn and grow. You also will not get stale. That's what you get out of it. You get to help others. You get to not be stale yourself. It's one thing to mentor people privately behind the scenes and help them grow. It's another thing to have them on your own platform and see them grow that way. But I don't know, maybe they see their platform as only their platform and not for anyone else. Instead of building silos, you should be collaborating. You should stop, collaborate, and listen. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> Truly a visionary line by Vanilla Ice there. So anyways, that's where I was going with the whole tweet thread that I had and Context was lost because I didn't thread it properly. Anyways, I saw that the Nightwing guy, the wear testers guy, posted a notes app apology on his Instagram moments later, like maybe even like 20, 15 minutes later. And this was a total fake apology. This is a, clearly a shot at me. He was not apologizing at all. He said, I've seen a lot of negative things being said about me over a post I made on Instagram. There were not a lot of the negative things. There was me. I was the only person who said something negative. He talks about how he mentored people privately and some of them do not make content. I was looking back and admiring my own work and it felt good, blah, blah, blah. And then he was clearly taking a shot at me saying, if I offended anyone, I sincerely apologize, but offending anyone was not my intention. I thought I was acknowledging all my hard work. Again, I apologize to anyone it may have hurt. That's like I said, not an apology. That's a fake apology. Clearly just a big fuck you at me saying that I was the one who was hurt. There's a big difference between being offended and finding you pathetic. That shit was willful and indignant. That was not admiring my creations. That was saying I want credit for shit I stopped doing six years ago. So this apology, whatever, this is not a slam dunk on me. I don't care what backhand of shots he's taking at me. If you have to open a notes app to write an apology and screenshot it and post it, you're taking the L, not me. I don't care if it's a fake apology. Notes app apology means you're taking the L. What, what happened to all the blocking out the noise? I thought you blocked out the noise. It sounds like you were very stung by the noise moments later after the one person dared to criticize you. Insecurity got this guy emotional twice now. But like I said, this fake apology, it didn't hurt me. I'm like that Garfield meme where it's like, huh, I wonder who's that for? It just finds no quarter with me. So those are my thoughts and gives the full context. I don't know. It just really bothered me when someone at a respected position is taking shots at people lower than them. And I don't even know who it was that he was taking shots at, these subtweets at. Please don't print to the newspaper that I'm mad. I'm not mad. It just bothers me when someone who's big tries to blame newcomers for their own staleness and their own lack of vision. And then the cheerleaders cheer them on for it. You know, that there's a Bible phrase that's like, to whom much is given, much is expected. It's not to whom much is given, they must also taketh flowers. So I can't make people think how I think. I can just adjust what I expect from people when they show me how they think. And I just expect less from those types of people. So that's it. That wraps up the online beef. You know, besides, online beefs are just how men mark time these days. Also in the news is a Tremaine Emery leaving Supreme in unceremonious way and this is first reported by a twitter account i'm too real for you back in april saying that he's basically on the way out things aren't going well and he's a really good source for supreme info so he's the one who first put it on my radar and then it kind of all blew up this week so the root of the issue seems to be according to tremaine about systematic racism how he was not told about how a collab with artist Arthur Jaffa was cancelled, how the design team is only made up of 10% minorities, and he posted a bunch of statements on Instagram, and he said in one of those posts that he wanted to align with Supreme on a statement, a joint statement that he left because of systematic racism. And first off right there, no company is going to put out a statement saying, yeah, 
the sky is leaving because of systematic racism here. It just does not seem plausible in the real world that any company would do that. And as a creative director at Supreme, the question is, what does a creative director even do? I know from my experience working in tech, a creative director is often a boss, someone who is dealing with people, co-signing on the direction and things like that, and not exactly drawing stuff. And with Supreme and how and when he was hired and how their collections go and how, you know, designing a t-shirt might take six months, there was no clear way of knowing of what items he did authorize and which ones were already in the pipeline when he got there. But he seemed like his intention was to be that person in the rooms, having a seat at the table to represent himself, represent black people, all that. And from that, it appears that he wanted to create almost like trauma streetwear. The Arthur Jaffa artist, he does art with graphic depictions of slavery and lynchings and things like that. And that's fine for an artist. Art is supposed to do that. It's supposed to elicit a reaction. And Supreme has ventured in this territory. I remember the Piss Christ t-shirts. If you know the story, there's an artist who pissed in a jug or something and there's a statue of Jesus in there and a, a small sidebar story on this is I have a friend, he's a, a Filipino friend, very religious, and he bought this t-shirt with the intention of wearing, and I think he just thought it was just a regular Christ shirt, and he was all happy about it. And then I told him about, you know, it's actually in a jar of piss, or, and he was shocked. He was like, oh, fuck, I can't have this in my house. What am I going to do? He was like actually traumatized about it. And then I think he dropped it off at a consignment store and eventually sold it. Anyways... I, I kind of held back on posting my thoughts on it because everything just looked like incomplete picture. You're getting pieces here, pieces there. And that's how the story was coming out over the days. I'm sure there's much more reasons for it. I know he had health issues and I know there could be reasons like he just wasn't the right fit. He was hard to work with or they didn't find value in his contributions. Like what he was bringing to the table was just not good enough. And that's the kind of stuff no one is going to say to your face. And it seems like that's what James Jebby and them did not want to do to Tremaine. You know, as a company, as Supreme started as a skate shop and has become this collab machine, you know, outwardly, it still represents skate culture, still represents youth culture. They're obviously inspired by black culture. They've done so many things with Martin Luther King, Obama, and artists like Public Enemy, and so many more. And as they've gotten older and the type of accessories that they're putting out there, it seemed to be also inspired by dad culture. But... How they operate inside has always been super secretive. We don't know who worked there. We didn't know the names of the creative director before they got Tremaine there. That's why it was such an interesting move to hire someone who already had a profile. So when a company is super secretive, it's not shocking to me that maybe there is systematic racism there and we don't know what goes on inside. Internally, they can say someone is not a fit. And then what does that mean? Does that mean they're not qualified or does it mean they're not like us? But if you're a minority in that room and just trying to pitch a regular design and you're not a fit, that's one thing. But if you're trying to pitch pictures of lynchings and stuff, it's kind of obvious to see why that's not a fit. Also, like if you were to fire someone for saying, oh, you're too angry at the office place and you fly off the handle. And then when you let them go, they get angry and fly off the handle. So it's ironic. And maybe this is the same kind of thing where this person doesn't work well with others and then... Once he does get fired or released or whatever it was, he posts all these private conversations and things like that, proving the very point of why you let him go in the first place. I actually thought it was kind of crazy that he posted those screenshots of conversations since, you know, that's kind of what Kanye did to him. It's like an invasion of privacy when someone is publicly posting your conversations. And some of the stuff that Kanye did say to him back then was very telling. He was saying, you know, these big companies, they don't hire creative directors. They hire Black Lives Matters officers or something like that and he was probably saying that derisively because of how Kanye thinks about the BLM movement but you know as Kanye is Kanye he could be wrong a lot of times but when he is right he's often very right but overall with this I think it's important to listen to what black people are saying what their reaction is because what they say carries the most weight to me but overall I think it's important to listen to what black people are saying what their reaction was and it was it was mixed, but there was a lot of backlash towards Tremaine as well, too. And I saw more backlash than I did support. Obviously, there's going to be support, but I did see people like saying, we don't want to wear this stuff. Why are you posting all this? Personally, I just found it all disappointing. He's definitely someone I root for and want to see him succeed. 
the stuff that he's done with no vacancy in was cool the denim tier stuff is not exactly for me but it did reach an audience and it does and it might not be fire to me but definitely is fire to some people but i don't know i don't know if that's his pinnacle i don't know if he still has a potential to do a fire collab anymore or not i guess we'll see Fake sneakers were also in the news in the last couple months since I covered topical news stories, but honestly, they're always in the news. There's always something coming up. There's this one TikTok video that was viral for a couple of days where the guy was showing a whole bunch of ultra fakes like Eminem 4s and Freddy Kruegers and stuff like that. The people who want fakes of these ultra rare grails, it doesn't make any sense. There's only two types of people that want those sneakers. The ultra rich collectors who already know how and where to get them and how to legit check them. And the people who absolutely love fakes, who have dived into the swimming pool of fakes and that's all they care about. Everyone in between just calls them grails, but know that it's out of reach and impossible. And then the other video was a kid who was opening up a bag of fake gallery department stuff. And that one is more interesting because that was the typical straw man argument that people will use of, What if a kid can't afford the luxury stuff that his friends are wearing and he just wants to fit in? And this kid was the embodiment of that. That's why that video went viral. If a kid wants to wear fakes, obviously I think the parents should know better. But if they don't and they're okay with it, I don't really care because it's a kid. It's cheap and it makes the kid happy. So go ahead, Kyler or Skyler or whatever your name is. Most likely for that kid, it'll be just a phase that they eventually move on from. And hopefully they all get to the point where they realize it's whack and move on from it. If you're 14, 15 and buying fakes, I understand you're a kid. Even someone in their early 20s, as I've documented on this podcast. Everyone in their early 20s is an idiot. But everyone else who's grown up and adult and super into fakes, that's just some real loser shit to me. Those are the people I just think something broke in their brain because they missed out on a drop one day. Just like a mini aneurysm that rewired their brain to say, I gotta get some bullshit from China on WeChat now. And I've used this analogy before, and I've said, if if you tell people you bought a fake, they will then automatically assume everything you now have is fake. Because as I've said, you've peed in the pool. It's stained everything. The only solution is to drain it or find a new pool and get rid of the fakes. But if something broke in your brain and you couldn't get that Freddy Krueger dunk, you got a pool full of fakes, then you dive in it. As I said, I've heard all these excuses and it's all just mental gymnastics to me. And that's why I don't even bother. I don't give any validity to them. It's just going down a cul-de-sac and coming back. It's never going to reach a certain point with me. Because it's all just mental gymnastics. Like, what's the point? Ah, the kid who can't afford it. It's all made in the same factory, bro. Travis Scott should make shoes for everyone. Travis Scott just did with Air Force One. He made those widely available. Or, you know, Nike is the real reseller. The latest one is that reps and fakes are part of the culture. I don't agree with that at all. That's like saying cancer is a part of healthcare. That shit is a disease we got to remove. Not, it's not part of healthcare. The fakes have ruined a lot of shoes. When I was in San Francisco, I saw someone wearing Chunky Dunks and I saw someone else wearing Dior ones. And my automatic thought was that those are probably fake. And that's what fakes have done. They've made it so you automatically think that with those types of shoes. But those shoes are impossible to obtain anyways. But the better example are the super highly faked shoes like the Mocha one, the University Blues. I don't even want to wear the one that I have that I know is legit because there's so many fakes out there that have basically ruined the sneaker for me. I don't want to sell it on the apps because there's a high chance that they could reject it even though I know I got it from Nike myself. So that's why I don't agree with the term that fakes are part of the sneaker culture. Any culture is about embracing things. It's not about embracing the wrong things like scammers and fakes. Those are the things that we should be pushing away from the community. I know that there's lots of rep stands out there with the popular reddits and stuff. People who use the 99 emoji instead of the 100 emoji. And they feel like they're warriors against consumer culture as well too. Like I said, something broke in their brain when they couldn't get that Travis one. And now they are anti-consumer culture warriors. You know, maybe there is something to be said about always chasing that next cop, that next sneaker, the FOMO you get when you do miss out. But anyone spending real money on fakes is a real victim here. The real victim of consumer culture is that person buying shit from WeChat. That is a person who's been chewed up and spit out by consumer culture. So now I'm supposed to listen to that person who's now pretending to be a counselor about this kind of stuff? I don't think so. It just sounds like mental illness to me. That's why you won't see me out here saying, buy fakes, or you do you, or this sneaker is one-on-one like the real one. 
all that is implicit endorsement and I don't stand for that. And if this is gatekeeping, so be it. Use that real money on a therapist. So we talked about fake sneakers, but I also want to talk about stolen sneakers. But in the context of stolen sneakers, I want to talk about the stuff that we see closer to the release date than the stuff we see super early on, which I think is more likely to be fake. I don't have anything to prove it. I don't have them in hand. I don't have the check check gap or anything like that. I just assume that stuff is fake. And we've seen some examples of this in the past. I remember the first looks that we saw of the Air Jordan 4 red cement had a white sock liner, but then the retail pair actually has a black sock liner. So all those early ones were supposedly fake, but they're going to say there were samples or some shit like that. So for the context of this segment, I'm going to be talking more about the sneakers that we see that fell off a truck that have been boosted from train tracks or something like that, stolen from the supply chain closer to the release date and not the super early stuff that we see that are more likely to be fake than real. And we've been seeing stories lately about how sneakers are getting stolen at every level of the supply chain and how it's affected retail Nike stores and Foot Locker and Dick's Sporting Goods as well. Foot Locker stock prices down, and I've said I'm not a business analyst about this kind of stuff, but if you look on just the stock price on Google, it's down 60% in the last six months. And in their reports, they blamed it on consumer softness, basically called you all bitches for not spending with them. And it's just a term that means people are not buying because of inflation or higher prices. But it also means that they don't want to pay full price for things. They're used to buying things on sale. And that's up to retailers to have that balance of when does stuff go on sale and when is it full price. Retailers and the brands themselves. But they also blamed it on shrink. Shrink is an industry term, a retail industry term. That means sneakers that are stolen from in-store. It could be employees stealing them. It could also be return fraud. The Dick Sporting Goods CEO said in one of their earnings statements that profitability fell short of expectations due in large part of the impact of elevated inventory shrink. That means we're missing a lot of product. And their stock price was down about 24% in the last six months or so, but has recovered a bit, so it's only down 15% or so. And stolen Nikes were also in the news recently. A couple weeks ago, there were stories about $400,000 worth of Nike was stolen from Memphis from shipping containers and people were arrested. And there was also a report about how organized crime is responsible for stolen Nike sneakers at every point in the supply chain. There was a Wall Street Journal story about it, which mostly was based off a report by a company called CargoNet, which according to their site is a theft prevention recovery network that often collaborates with law enforcement and retail. So in the Wall Street Journal story, it talks about how LA police in June seized about $3 million worth of Nike products that were stolen from a warehouse near the port in LA. And one of the shoes that was in those boxes were the Nocta Glide and a couple others. And in the report, it said even just weeks before that they had arrested dozens of people who were part of a crime ring that were doing a lot of the smash and grabs around the Nike stores, which you may have seen viral videos of of people just running in, grabbing as much stuff as they can and running back out. But when you see a video like that, it's just like four or five people who decided to go rob this one store. But it's not exactly a shock if organized crime is behind this, not only just the, the crash and grab stuff from retail, but obviously from stealing from warehouses, Memphis and Port of LA, the storage yards, stealing from shipping containers in transit, stealing from delivery. Really, you'll see this kind of news every couple of weeks where a whole bunch of stuff was stolen. Maybe there was a couple of arrests. And in our world, in sneaker world, you will notice the impact of this as well, too. When Jordan Cherry 11 started hitting Instagram pictures, you'll see people with now stacks of those gratitude Jordan 11s as well, too. The two are linked. But anyone with a stack of Jordan 11s is not going to say we boosted this from a train tracks. They're going to say we backdoored these sneakers. It's hard to talk about backdoor sneaker without talking about people who get them early. There's lots of people who get early pairs. There's like random accounts on Instagram. There's people like Private Selection or Yankee Kicks and Whore Head Sales on Twitter as well. So any early pairs, the question is, are they backdoored? Are they fake? Are they stolen? How do they get them? So as usual, I like to put my disclaimer up front. I'm just a guy in Canada. I live far away from this world. I don't backdoor. I don't buy fakes. I don't have any stolen sneakers. Some of these people I'll talk about, I follow them. They follow me, but it's not people who are my buddies or anything like that. I don't know where they get their sneakers. I'm assuming they're real sneakers. I'm assuming they're all law-abiding citizens, allegedly. 
So all this is just going to be me using logic and reasoning, which is my usual MO on this podcast. So for most of the people I will talk about, I will say that I don't believe that they promote fakes. Yankee kicks, I'm not quite sure about. But everyone else that I'll mention, I don't think they sell fake sneakers. Or head sales on Twitter sells a lot of early pairs as well too. And he's usually not the first to leak a shoe that's usually private selection, but he is one of the people who has hundreds of pairs early and flexes them as much on Twitter. He's posted the Udo Dunks, the Crenshaw Skate Club, and he usually specializes in SB, but has had others like that clot shoe. And he d- usually doesn't have a full size run, usually it's like particular sizes based on the post that he's posted. And the point of the release that he gets them is usually a few weeks out, so he's got the box and everything, and it's not very early where it's a no box pair and he's tweeted that he's very confident that what he sells are not fakes he said when people reply to him all these are all fakes he said pick any pair if it's fake i'll give you ten thousand dollars and one of his posts recently made the sneaker media rounds when he posted a whole bunch of those clot dunks and later he posted that he just got off the phone with edison chen the owner of clot And that Edison was like, wow, I respect your hustle and I'm going to send you a friends and family pair. And people had a negative reaction to this is like, why is Edison Chen talking to a guy who has early sneakers, all of your early sneakers, and is offering you a friends and family pair over it? Edison Chen eventually had to respond to this on his Instagram. And he basically said he had a conversation with Jorge and they exchanged information on a leak of their unreleased shoes. And he said that Intel is valuable and hopefully can stop random leaks in the future. So this interaction told you a lot in that the shoes are not fake because you will offer $10,000 if they are. They were obviously not backdoored from Edison Chen himself because Edison Chen is out here talking about how did this happen. So that leaves only the implication that these sneakers are either backdoored from someone under Edison Chen in his company somewhere, or that they're stolen, allegedly. The Born and Raised Dunk is another sneaker that was in the news in these kind of same circles. And rest in peace to Sponto, I didn't get to talk about this. Another one of those cases where you see so many stories of when someone has passed, and every story is like, wow, that guy's an awesome guy. And Everyone who dealt with them just had amazing stories to tell. And I really do appreciate the people who take the time to tell those stories. And I like reading those stories. And I don't know if that's kind of my personal way of kind of sharing the burden of grief. So I don't know if that helps the people, his friends and family. But in my head, it does that when you do think about someone like that who's passed and anyone who's a young father, I'm going to be thinking about them a lot. So rest in peace to him. So then obviously Nike was going to postpone the release. And then a couple of weeks later, it started making the rounds that an early pair seller, Just Feats, wrote a tweet saying he just got off the phone and the release is canceled. And then that was picked up and I think it was over under the Twitter account it was where I saw it first. And I followed it up with, I, you know, I don't think they're going to be canceled. Most likely they will do something special with it when the time comes and it'll probably be sneakers app only or to born and raise themselves. I did see the original poster, Just Feats, then clarify that he didn't think it was outright canceled, that they are just going to release it a different way. But by then, it had already spread. And then later in the day, Z Sneakerheads confirmed the same kind of thing. And like I said, that was just me using logic and reasoning, not any inside information. But a follow-up that came from that was Jorge Sales himself. It said he saw that reportedly a lot of very big skate shops had lost their accounts because they had backdoored that sneaker. And from what I know about SB releases is a lot of them do not get it months or weeks ahead. They usually try to time it so that they get it the week of, maybe a week and a half, two weeks out. And that way it matches up with the invoices and that, so the invoices that the shop pays to Nike is paid around that same time. Instead of having a shop having to pay an invoice three months ahead and then not having the cash flow for having to hold it for two months. So, you know, it makes kind of logistical sense that way. So that's why I didn't believe that a lot of skate shops lost their account about this because most of them would not have had the shoes in hand. And the original tweet was like some very, very big accounts. And so when you hear that, you think of, you know, big skate shop accounts like Premiere and Undefeated. And obviously places like that getting their account canceled would be huge news. So I asked around, I couldn't get the name of any. And so I had tweeted the same kind of thing. I basically said, I just don't believe they lost their account because of what I said, the logistics reason. And Jorge did reply to me and say that there was actually three local ones and they had 100 plus. 
I'm not in LA. I don't know the names of these three local ones. I don't know how big they are, but they can't be in the level of undefeated then. But if they lost their account, we will all eventually know because they will stop posting that they have it. So I was thinking about this and I was like, anytime news comes out about a sneaker from people who sell early pairs, you have to kind of pause and think about their motives. Especially if I've heard the exact opposite, but even if I don't have any inside info and I could just use logic and reasoning, then I wonder why are they saying this? So any early seller's motivations are always going to be get attention, sell the product, and therefore make money. Just like I always said earlier, everything is pro wrestling. That's the same thing in pro wrestling. But the illusion any early seller wants to have is that everything you have is backdoored and legit because sneaker culture is okay with backdooring. That part has been accepted as part of the culture. If you have fakes, that part is not part of the culture. People, for the most part, are not okay with fakes. Well, what about stolen sneakers then? Is sneaker culture okay with sneakers stolen by organized crime groups? It seems like it kind of is. Most wouldn't willingly buy a pair of sneakers if the seller says, yeah, these are stolen. But what seller would say that? No one's going to admit to crimes when trying to do a sale. And that's what creates this gray area. They're not stolen. They fell off a truck in Memphis. They're not stolen. They're backdoored. So often when news comes from some of these early sellers, I always think about what's their motivation? Why are they saying this? Are they trying to create an illusion that they are getting backdoored sneakers? I know that they have good information because they are in those gray areas. They do know a lot of things, but they also do not want to say everything they know for obvious reasons. But everything is pro wrestling. You got to create an illusion. You got to create a distraction. And if you could just sprinkle some misinformation out there here and there, the story moves on quickly. The heat gets off you quickly. But what if feds do a sweep? What if these are all stolen goods and they're confiscated and even worse, people are arrested and charged? Is there accounting for all these early sneakers? Where did you get this sneaker from? Who is your source? All that kind of stuff. I saw a story once that all these stories about stolen stuff from shipyards and rail and ports and stuff only comes out because of police unions and they want to raise more money and you know buy more gear and stuff like that. And then actually stopping or preventing crime, you know, that's kind of lower on the priority list. But I wouldn't be shocked if there is a sweep eventually one day because retail places like Foot Locker and Dick's Sporting Goods are blaming shrink on their stock price dip. Police unions are campaigning for more money for this kind of stuff. That cargo net report company gets paid by both retailers and police and putting news out there. So what if all this pressure mounts and the police or feds are forced to do a sweep? Then what? You know, the game is the game when it comes to backdooring sneakers or gaming lineups and stuff like that. The game is not the game when it comes to proceeds of crime, organized crime groups, wire fraud, and RICO charges. This has been episode 57 of the Sock Jake Sneaker Podcast. Thank you for listening. I hope you don't get hit with RICO charges. And most of all, I hope you can go fuck yourself. <laughs>